Hello everyone, in this video we are talking about shaft design, deflection consideration. The first part was stress consideration and then we are moving to deflection which is another mode of failure and needs to be considered. So deflection analysis is different from a stress analysis from the point that we need to consider the whole geometry and the whole length of the shaft. So if we have a shaft here, if you are going to change the deflection at any point, that depends on the geometry at the beginning, in the middle, and at the other end. Unlike stresses, that if we see the stresses are very high, we can simply increase the diameter at that region. So stresses are local, and deflection is the global parameter. So which makes it a little bit challenging and the procedure tedious because each time we have to repeat the process. For finding the deflection, we can either use the integration method using the equation mxie, or this is the, the curvature. If you take another one integration, we would have the slope. And then if you have another integration, you're gonna have the deflection. As you can see, it depends on the moment of inertia and also the, the modulus but not on SY or ultimate so the strength doesn't come into play for deflection analysis. One factor that we need to think about is the difference between deflection and deformation. These two terms are used interchangeably but they are actually different. So if you look at the example here is Boeing 787, the Boeing 787 is made of composite so it can deflect even more because the stiffness is lower. And now we are talking about 26 feet of deflection. This is not true failure, this is a normal operating uh, condition of the aircraft. So we are having, we are talking about 26 feet of deflection. And that's completely normal. But for deformation, it's a totally different story. Consider this beam that you see on the right. So after deflection, it takes a curvature. And the central axis is not going to change, but the top part is going to be in compression, and the bottom part would be in tension. The radius of the curvature, let's call it rho. And let's take a segment of this deflected shaft or beam let's look into it further the def deformation angle would be d theta or the shear deformation again we have the central axis we call it x so the bottom part that is in tension would be x prime of course x prime is going to be more than x and rho would be the radius of the curvature c would be the distance from the central axis to any part of interest for our shaft so the deformation would be x prime minus x. So the deflection would be the y displacement. So this is, could be the radius of a curvature or a deflection for us. And the deformation would be x prime minus x. It indicates how much our cross section has displaced. And that would result in stresses. We change this to, to a strain and then we'll get our stresses. So deformation tells us about our stresses, but deflection is simply in, in y direction. We could have a large displacement deflection without having any failure. So make sure to distinguish deflection from deformation. And if you were gonna write our equation for it, x prime is rho plus c d theta, and x would be rho d theta. Here, if you want to find a strain, would be the displacement over the initial length, and that gives us C over rho. So following the euler bernoulli theory, that's the Hooke's law, relating the stresses with the strain, and we know strain is C over rho, so stresses would be simply E, C over rho. We also know that the stresses through the bending that causes the deflection would be fined by MCI. 
setting these to equal, and then getting rid of the C, so we know the curvature, 1 over rho, 1 over the radius of a curvature is also called curvature, is mxie. Well, let's see if we can relate this to the deflection. This is the mathematical equation relating the deflection with radius of curvature. If, if the deflection is small, then the driven, then the to the power of two, this component would go to zero, and then we could have a simpler equation. And that's our basis for finding deflection or based on Euler Bernoulli theory. Dy over dx, the second derivative we show it y, y double prime, m over ie. If you want a slope, that would be one integration. If you want deflection, that would be double integration. So why deflection is important for us for shafts? Because shafts are supporting gears and are mounted at bearings. Bearings are very sensitive to slopes because if you have higher slopes, that would increase wear, increase friction, increase vibrations. For gears, the alignment would be an issue. The mesh, they're not gonna be completely mesh and they're gonna wear faster. So let's look at these shaft if they are, if they are if the slopes are very high at the bearings, at the bearings we care about the slope at the two end because the deflection would be zero, our bearings act as a support. And at the middle for the gears we care about the deflection. So slope for bearings and deflection for gears. If you go to manufacturer tables that would give you allowable range for slopes for each set of bearings. You can see taper roller bearings are very sensitive to slope. That's a very small slope that we are allowed to have. More than that, the bearings are not going to function well. The friction is going to be so high that the shaft is not going to be able to rotate freely. When it comes to gears, we think about the deflection. And then for gears, also the deflection range is, is given for us. If we're going to summarize euler bernoulli theory, we have the deflection. If we take a derivative of the deflection, we get the slope, another derivative, we get the moment, another derivative, we get the shear, and the distributed loading. So when we go from here, we are actually taking derivative, and then when we go from the other side, we are taking an integration from distributed to transfer, slope to bending, and, and so forth. So if you look at this example, if you have a beam or a shaft under distributed loading, if it's uniform if it's a constant distributed loading then our shear would be linear here the first order our moment would be second order then our slope would be third order as i'm not showing here and then our deflection would be uh, the fourth order so we need to pay attention to to this deflection analysis is simple but it's very uh, lengthy it's tedious so that's why a lot of softwares are used, especially FEA software such as ANSI, Abacus, to perform deflection analysis. We need to know the basics of deflection so we can confirm our answer when we are using a software. But for complex scenarios, uh, FEA software would, would do better for us. But if the deflection is not within the range that we allow, like the table that we saw, what are our options? What are we going to do? How much are we going to increase the diameter to lower our deflection? We know it has to do with the diameter. The larger diameter are not going to deflect as much. But how much are we going to increase that? So we're just going to go back to the equation. If you remember the equation was simply m i e. So our deflection this is the curvature, but also slope and deflection, both of them are inversely proportional to I, moment of inertia. And also I is directly proportional to the diameter of the force. So I can conclude that the slope and deflection are proportional to inversely proportional to the diameter of the force. 
So if I want to find a new diameter versus the old diameter, all I have to do is that y old, we talk about inversely proportional, that would be to the fourth, the fourth root. So what is the y new? This is the new deflection that we desire. Y old is the old deflection that we had and we didn't like. We want to find a new diameter. So basically the new diameter would be the old diameter that we have and then this is the increase that we need to get. The new deflection that we desire is the allowable deflection that the, that the manufacturer will let us have based on the gear or the bearings divided by a factor of safety we don't, because we don't want to reach that value, that threshold. We just want to have a margin of safety and that's why this one is simplified to if you bring that to numerator, y old, y allowable, the fourth order. Once we have this, we have the old diameter, we know what would be our allowable range, we know the deflection that we found, we know what would be the new diameter to use to reach the value of desirable deflection or slope. So here we are going to solve a problem in a shaft design. It was determined that the slope at the right bearing is 0 0.001095, which is the near the limit of for the cylindrical roller bearing. So this is the old slope. So this is y prime old. Determine an appropriate increase in diameter to bring this slope to 0 0.005 radian. So that's the new slope. We want to find a ratio basically. So d new over the old, which are, would be y old over y new, or y prime here in this case, one to the fourth. We have y prime old, y prime new, and then one to the fourth. So if you look at it, we'll get the value of 1.216 so we have to multiply all of our diameters because we might not have only one diameter our shaft might have might be a step shaft with multiple diameters so we have to multiply each diameter by this new factor so we have to increase our diameter 20 21 percent to be able to lower our deflection to an allowable uh, deflection range or slope. The other concept is angular deflection, which is a little bit counterintuitive. It's, it's hard to, to visualize it. It's not as easy as compared to normal deflection. So you can think of it as, as a shaft. If you have a shaft here, Now let's say our shaft is under torsion. That's why we get that deflection value. So if you have a point here, can I call this gamma, which is our shear deformation. And this angle is theta. That would be my angular deflection. So this is R, this is L. So if you want to relate the two, R theta would be, give me this segment here, would be equal to L gamma. So theta would be simply L or R gamma. Remember, gamma is shear deformation. It does not depend on the length of the shaft. And theta would be the angular deflection that we are talking about here. 
that's the reflection that is gonna increase the wear of our bearing. It's gonna create vibration for us. But what is gamma? If you remember the shear equation, gamma is G, tau would be G gamma, which this one would be the shear stress. G is the shear modulus. Here for us, and gamma is the shear deformation. So tau over G. So if I replace this into this equation, I get theta L tau R G. And what is tau? Tau that is causing by the shear by the torsion would be T C over J or T R over J R G getting rid of all of these would be L T G J and that's the angular deflection. J is the polar moment of inertia g is the shear modulus t is the torsion l is the length so you can see the angular deflection depends on the length gamma was not function of the length theta angular deflection is function of the length so as the shaft gets longer the angular deflection becomes more and more serious and more problematic for us so we have to incorporate that so if you look at it again we have tl gj but what if our shaft is a step shaft therefore our uh, l and j would be different each case we use li and ji what if everything is different what if the torque will change the material will change so we can look at these as cases in series and incorporate each segment separately. So basically we can think of it as a rotational spring relation between the torque that you apply and the deflection that you get. And that's the rotational spring constant. So if T would be K theta, and also GJ or L, so that rotational spring would be GJL.